Real time festival, y'all. <laughs> we just having a good time. Metro. Real time festival is here and the love is incredible. It's for everyone in general, so don't be left behind like a vegetable. With no grudge, you need to show love for humanity. Whether you're young or grown up, no time to discriminate, so don't judge. How we do what we do and make the most of our lives as well as creativity. Chasing our dreams and hoping for longevity. So you can call this a special delivery from a poet that stands out like the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> oh my, you go give me a high five. If you get to see the world through my eyes. Cause I'm really getting used to the bright lights. I like a midgy midgy, I'm quite nice. Yeah. What's that? No, I did it good now. Bad man team. Everybody, put your hands up. Put your hands up. Nigeria, all over the world. <laughs> We just having a good time. Woo! Yeah. It drop. You know. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, real time hey, festival is that. here and the love give is incredible. That. Yeah, yeah. Give It's for that. everyone in general. So don't be left behind like a vegetable. Oh, Sound boy. You know how you did go now. Bad man team. Everybody, put your hands up. Real time festival is here and the love is incredible. Eh? You the villain, my be. Woo! Oyana, Oyana, let me see you do that. Oyana, Oyana, eh? Oyana, Oyana. <laughs> We just having a good time. Oh my, you go give me a high five. Yeah, you go give me a high five. You know. Uh, yeah, yeah, eh? Give me that. Give me that. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Give me that. Eh? Give me that. Eh? Real-time festival is here and the love is incredible. It's for everyone in general, so don't be left behind like a vegetable. You know how you did good now. Bad man. Everybody, put your hands up. As I was saying, like when I when I light when I light, um, I usually I just pretend I'm making a mo I'm making a painting. And as a painting student, one thing that we were told was that you paint from dark to light. So you don't throw in your you don't throw in your bright colors first and begin to put the dark colors on top of the bright colors. What you do instead is you put the darkest colors as your base uh, color, and then you begin to lay your colors, the brighter colors on top of it. Uh, you mix your colors on the palette, and then you begin to apply them uh, accordingly, the way you want. Uh, so that's where tonal gradation comes in. And again, I'm making reference to painting here because every time we do lighting design, uh, it's actually, we're actually painting, but this time we're not using the canvas, we're painting digitally uh, on thin. So lighting design for me is how you've decided to tell your story with the lights. It's not just about lighting. I see a lot of movies where people have done very good lighting. They've done very good lighting, but they've not done any lighting design. Uh, so good lighting is not necessarily good lighting design. So this thing now where I'm sitting down here is well lit. Uh, you can see my face clearly, right? Can you guys see my face clearly? Good. Yes, I can see your face Good, but is this the most dramatic you can get from this shot of Stanley talking to 15 guys in the room? So let me try something. Maybe I'm using my son as an apprentice today, uh, just so that we can check some things out. Yeah, just come and say hi. Yeah. You can't see your face now. Calm down, calm down. 
that's that's the okay. Okay, so I need I need a production assistant. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna ask David to turn off this light in front of me. Turn it off. Okay, now this light in front of me is turned off. And if I was faced with this situation on the film set, how would I solve the problem? This is typically if I was shooting my movie like this with that light turned off, then I'll be doing what is called practical lighting. So I'm using the light in the room to just shoot my scene the way it is. So I have the lights from the TV coming from behind, and then I have a bit of key light. So now when you talk about key light, key light, backlight, the key light is essentially your most dominant light. So for me now, I have a window to the right here. And that is where my key light is coming in from at this moment. Now, my key light in this situation, if I was telling a very gloomy, moody story, and I'm talking to tell you a story about a guy who is in depression and he's in solitude and he's having a difficult time even being alive, he wants to take his life and all that. This lighting works as practical lighting, but it's just the most dramatic we can get out of this shot. So that's where placing layers of colors. What is light? What is color? Color is actually light. So when you start saying blue, green, yellow, what uh, purple, it's just the, those are the qualities that the lights now uh, take on when they travel through the spectrum, when they travel through space, and then they hit your eyes, and then because of the spectrum, they travel through and your eyes, interpret that light and gives it a tone or a hue or whatever you want to call it. And then you say that's the color of the light. But color is actually light. And every color out there is just a reflection of light. So now if I have this as my practical lighting, and I said, okay, forget about the resolution in which this is right now. This is not the best resolution. But let's pretend this was the, in the best resolution. It is okay. One thing I want everybody to know is that there's always room, always room to improve on the image you have. The slightest thing you add to every shot, every light source matters. I want you to write that down. Every light source matters. Every little beam of light matters. So when you think you've gotten this perfect lighting and then you just introduce one small thing, you now realize that, oh, this little thing I just introduced is making the shot look so beautiful. You understand what I'm trying to say? So, uh, check it out. This is our shot and it looks good. And let's say we're shooting even 4K and this resolution is good and the shot looks perfectly well. And then we do this. Now, I do this a lot when I'm filming. So I've set up my scene, everything looks good. And I tell my PA or my camera assistant or the person walking close to me, and I say, you know what, I need just a bit of light to brush this part of the space. What am I doing? I'm seeing that scene and the subject in front of me as images on the canvas. Now, if that was a painting and this side of the face was looking dark, what I'll most likely do is take my paintbrush, get the tone of color I want to put to that part of the face to make it stand out on the background. And then when I put that stroke there, the person pops out, right? Right? Can we all hear me? Okay, now, let's look at everything that you see in front of you on the screen. As, just see them as uh, paintings on the canvas. Every time you're lighting, you see the human beings, the elements, the props, everything. Just see them as paintings on the canvas. And then the question is, is this the best painting I can attain on this canvas? Now, let's do something quickly. I'm going to use the light on my phone now to just bounce some little light on my face. Baby, this, I don't know what's happening. Where's the light on this one? You guys disabled. Okay, tell her to join to give me her light. Yeah. Okay, so quickly. Uh, this, my, the light, my touch, my touch light on this phone is not on. This is just the light from the screen, right? Right? So check this out. Yes. This normal light from the screen. Let me move it close to my face. Is it making a difference? See, all, yes. of a sudden, all of a sudden, this shot that looked like it was okay, with just a little 
more light begins to look more dramatic. And now this is my key light based on my natural lighting. And that key light is coming from the window and is the ambient light from the sun. And then I'm like, okay, you know what? I need a fuel light. And the fuel light is necessarily just supposed to put some uh, light on the part of the face where the key light isn't getting to, the place where you have the shadows. Now the position of the of the fuel light still matters a lot. So where do you want to put this fuel light now so it complements what the fuel light is doing? If you put the fuel light too close to the face this way, then you are beginning to get what is called high key lighting. And this high key is not as dramatic as low key. Low key lighting always looks moody. It always has a very beautiful uh, texture to it. It always has uh, a very well balanced contrast. And above all, it always looks cinematic. Have you ever wondered why you see 10 movies and two movies out of the 10 are low key in their lighting technique and the other eight are high key? So if I'm going to talk about low and high key, for instance, Ronya, right here, Ronya is high key in her lighting. So everything is like Indian thing, all things bright and beautiful. All creatures great and small. You see, there's so much light. <laughs> Indians light in a way that it's almost like, okay, you know what? Everything, even if you're in your room at 2 a.m., you're under the sun, but they do it so well. I think the best uh, practitioners of high-key lighting are actually the Indians. You can't take it away from them. They do high-key lighting so well, and they, they even do it in cinematic films, and you accept it because it still looks beautiful. But uh, I've seen that shortcoming in most Nigerian productions where they do high key lighting and they want to put a lot of light everywhere. And then something that's supposed to be thin begins to look like TV or a series. Now, let's go to Game of Thrones, for instance. The reason why a lot of people got attracted and drawn to Game of Thrones, beyond the cinematography, beyond the set design, the production design, the art direction, and all the wonderful CGI and VFX, was because it just looked cinematic, right? So you are watching Game of Thrones and you didn't feel like you are watching a series or something that is made for TV because they did not plan it as uh, something that will look like a TV concept. They planned it as something that will look like you are watching a never-ending non-stop movie. And then let's go right over it again. There's low-key lighting, there's high-key lighting, there's a lot of things in between. I'll leave it to figure out all the in-betweens because we don't have so much time. But high-key means the lights are everywhere. You see what uh, Oli Lomo did just now with his phone. David, let, let me have that light. Okay, so check this out now. Uh, my key light is this way, coming from the, uh, the window, you understand? Uh, and then I want to balance it up, and I put a field light here, just so that. And the position of that field light is very important. If I put it this way, it's not as dramatic as when I do this. When I do this, you see what's happening? There's this slight spot on my face here. And this is, the light is spreading from here to the rest of the face, and it looks beautiful. Now, when you talk about the intensity of the light, when I was talking about paintings, for instance, I said, it's not about the color of the light, it's about the value, the, the level of the color, you know, the level of the lighting. So if I equate colors to light, or lights to colors like I did before, it's not about whether it's red or blue. It's about the value, that is the hue, the saturation, and the level of that blue light. If I draw this light very close, like this, you see what's happening. The same intent, the light is in the same position, but it's not giving me the result I wanted. Because if this light doesn't have a dimmer, I can dim not to burn up my face like this and remove the cinematic uh, essence I was looking for. The next thing I need to do on a film set knowing exactly what I want to achieve, is change the position of the light. Now, there are two ways people do this, uh, if they want to achieve what I'm talking about. On a typical thing, sir, people just throw the diffusers there. Oh, bring diffusers. Let's put a diffuser there. The light is too bright. What happened to just moving the light away? You see what just happened now? So on a typical thing, sir, they waste a lot of time. Ah, PA, where's the light? Put the put the gel, put the, gel, put the diffuser. And everybody is there running health aspects and time is going. But a more experienced person will just take that light, either tilt it away, tilt it. So what I'm doing now, which is why I call this session light bending. 
I'm actually just bending the light to suit exactly what I want to achieve with what I'm doing. So check it out. This is my lighting situation. And you say, oh, the position of the light is bad. Oh, the position is not bad. The distance between the light and the subject is wrong. I move it away, it begins to look like what I want. I move it even further, and now I'm getting some very low-key lighting that looks cinematic and beautiful. Okay, let's run away from low-key and high-key now. Um, why do we call it lighting design? It's a design because just like in animation, when you say you're doing character design, you are designing a character for a purpose. So if I wanted to create a character that is going to be the art villain of Thanos in the Avengers, for instance, that means I need to design a character that will look more fearsome than Thanos, right? A character that the moment you see this guy, you know that, ah, this guy will beat Thanos, he will nearly beat Thanos. Okay. Uh, what is this guy? There's this other guy. There's this other guy. Um, there's this other guy in uh, DC. That's, it's a dark side. Uh -huh. you see, when they put dark side and Thanos together, you, it is believable that Thanos has uh, a worthy opposition, a worthy opponent who can fight him. Because dark side, the way he was designed, he almost looks like Thanos. The same beauty, the same uh, main look on his face and all that, the same... They almost look like it's one and the same, so they are two bad guys. So now, when you want to design the lighting for a movie, now the first question is, what is happening with the scene? What is happening with the character? Who is this character? What's going on in his mind right now? What do I want the people to feel when they are watching this scene? Do I want them to feel scared? Now, if I want them to feel scared, check out the position of my light. Ha, 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 ha. So just moving the lights to the base of my face and pointing it up already makes people feel scared in this scene. Now, an experienced lighting designer will take the screenplay and break down everything according to what he wants to achieve with the lights. So scene 22, the guy is hiding somewhere from the person who is about to kill him and he's holding a touch light. Now, there is something called, uh, there has to be a practicality for the source of every light. You can't just put a light source because you say, oh, I want this guy to, I want to light him in a way that looks scary. And then the guy is in the closet. And then you're going to put one light here. The question is, where that light come from? You understand? A lot of people do that, but they know it. There has to be a believable reason why their light is there. So, a, an experienced lighting designer will now look at that story and tell the producer or director and say, you know what, in this scene, why don't we give him a touch light? So he runs into the closet with a touch light. So it might not have been included in the screenplay, but the lighting designer begins to make his recommendation. Give him a touch light so that in scene 23, when he's in the closet and that sound begins to get closer, let him just all of a sudden the light comes on and he's trying to flip it off and the thing is refusing to go off. But in the process of doing that, number one, you are creating panic in your storytelling. Number two, you just found an excuse to put this light where it should be for the guys doing this, and all of a sudden the scene looks scary. You understand what I'm trying to say? So again, everything must have a source. So now let's jump to what the colors mean when you do lighting design. You introduce a blue color to your lighting. All of a sudden, everything feels cold and it's beginning to look like uh, people are not happy, they are moody, they are gloomy, something is not right. You introduce orange and it feels warm. And it feels like, okay, imagine a scene where two lovers are having dinner and you put it, it you light it in a blue way. No matter how warm they are towards each other, then you can turn on the light, okay, let's turn it up again. No matter how warm, you see the difference now, this is high key lighting, very high key. You can see my face very bright and all of a sudden so again uh the lights in front of me i will tweak them just uh after the first session of q a and i'm going to do some basic lighting here so that it's kind of practical so you can see what i'm talking about uh so when you decide on each thing and this is what i do when i make any movie the same way that uh someone would take the same way someone would take um, a script and say i'm doing the breakdown for costume 
or I'm doing the breakdown for props, or I'm doing the breakdown for anything else. I take my screen and I do my breakdown for the lighting. So scene by scene, it has to be a story that's being told by my lighting design so that if someone meets the movie and is watching the movie without any sound, someone who is experienced, who understands lighting design, who understands the use of light and all that, you'll be able to say, you know what, I know what's happening here right now. So this is one scene and then this guy is running into a room and all of a sudden where he's running from is blue and he's running into a room where there's an orange light facing him. Why would I do this in a movie, for instance? He's running from a blue room. Blue it signifies coldness, being alone. Uh, it uses it for scary things. So perhaps he's running from a place where he's scared to a place where he can find solace, to a place where there's someone there who can actually give him some help. So again, you don't see this in a lot of movies because people are not really thinking about the lighting design. They're just thinking about lighting the scene. So you might see what I just described in a movie, but the person just did it to start to be planned. But the goal is to plan it and be intentional with the lighting design to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do in this scene. Okay, let me give us a scenario now. And I'm going to ask this question and then everybody has, uh, just wave your hands and you have the, uh, the permission to unmute yourself and just answer me. Let me see if you understand what I'm saying. Scene 21, the guy and the lady, they're having a misunderstanding. And then he walks out of the room. And then in the next room, waiting for him there, is his ex-lover. And there's no dialogue. They just look at each other and smile. How would you like that scene? First instance is he's with his girlfriend in the room. They're not having a good time. They're having an argument. Everything is early. He walks out of that room and he walks into another room and he finds his ex-lover there and they smile at each other. So the suggestion is that he's going from this relationship that is not working and he's walking back to an, uh, an available alternative of something that he had in the past. So please, can someone explain to me if you were using colors to tell this story, what would you do? Excuse me. Uh, you have my permission to unmute your mic. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I just pick up a bit more. Okay, so, okay, so I would say from where you are having a misunderstanding, uh, but that is more like moods mood are changing. Um, that would be like the blue light. It will be the blue light. So now walking into the next room and his ex girlfriend is there, orange, which is warmth, and even with having any dialogue, just the facial expression, the body language is inviting something warming and more like a reconnection. So as we said earlier, orange represents warmth and comfort. So okay. from blue to orange. Thank you. Uh, someone is raising your hand, so let's see. Okay. Okay, I think I'll, okay. I think I'll prefer from orange to blue, like from okay. the warmth and to the blue, the blue tell is more why. cool. Tell me why. Yeah. Okay, tell the blue color is okay. The blue color it it signifies um, coolness or something, something calm and quiet. And I think um, the orange is more hot and tense compared to the blue. Yeah. Okay, that's another perspective. Okay, now let me take let me our mics. Let me now talk about what these two guys just said and tell you how, even though one person seems to have the generic solution which is like undis indisputable which is working from blue to orange which directly tells the story the other view of working from orange to blue still tells the story and i'll tell you the story it tells so in a story arc why i will go from blue to orange is the normal reason things are not working out and i'm trying to tell the people that this relationship is about to be over right okay so Let's go to the other one where you're going from orange to blue. Why would I do that? If he goes from having this uh, argument with his present girlfriend and everything is orange and he walks into the next room and uh, he meets his ex-girlfriend there and they smile at each other and everything is blue there. I'm trying to tell you that he's walking away from what works for him to what will not work for him. So I'm trying to suggest that this relationship he's in right now is actually the best thing for him 
And even though he walks into this next room and he's smiling at this chick, this thing is not going to work. She doesn't have full affection for him and she's actually cold towards him emotionally, but face value, she's warmly and she's, you know, she, she, she's receptive towards him. So again, you see what I was saying? So now there's an intent for that lighting. So there's actually no way to do your lighting design that is wrong, especially but you must have a reason why you did it, which you must be able to define. So, uh, uh, and then, and then, and then your, your mic is loud. Okay, so there must be a reason. But you know the funny thing is that I can't just light that thing that way and go from orange to blue if I've not been doing something with my lights from the beginning. So I must have been doing something with my lighting design from the beginning that someone who is looking out for the lighting design would have noticed from the moment he started looking at the movie. And then he can tell that, oh, you see how very simply for someone who has a reputation for using lighting design to tell stories, how people can actually follow his or her movie without actually listening to dialogue. And then you can meet the person's movie, watch it from the beginning to end, and tell what happened without hearing what anybody said. But then you must have been repeated. You must have that reputation for telling stories with your lighting design. Because if you just did that scene just now and moved from orange to blue, and it's just a one-off in the whole movie, then in that case, that is a wrong choice for your lighting design. So does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, yes, I do. Yeah. Okay, okay. You have the floor, uh, Yes, uh, good afternoon, Stanley. Good afternoon. Yes, uh, talking about uh, lighting design now, I, wa I want to see where would a production designer and a lighting designer uh, come into a holy matrimony? Because if I want to tell <laughs> Uh, a story in a certain way and for somebody like me I pay a lot of attention in production design maybe because I'm not a lighting person and that's why I wanted to join this class is that where would we have to sit down and design and either, uh, either, either bring in the lighting design into the production design or the production design into the lighting design for example on Facebook now somebody was asking me that when they give a review of my film on Facebook, after they watched it, they said, why is it so dark? Uh, so, but uh, there was something I wanted, there was a story I wanted to tell, there was a mood I wanted to tell, but yeah, from the perspective... Use low-key lighting. Yes, low-key lighting from the perspective of a production designer. So where do I have to now bring them together? Okay, let me quickly answer that question. I saw your movie too. The low-key lighting in your movie made me feel heavy watching the film. You see? So the motive of that worked. I just felt that heaviness from the beginning to the end because of the low-key lighting. Even when they were exterior at the symmetry and all of that, the lighting, everything, you did your you gained and exposed even in the exterior to still maintain that low-key attribute of the entire movie. So again, it's important to be able to measure what you are doing indoors so that by the time you put your outdoor scene, Things don't just pop from one end to the other. Now, let me answer the question about the production designer and the lighting designer. They are all in the creative department. So the director over sees everything, and then there's the, the cinematographer, who is like the best friend of the director, who a lot of us also call the DOP. Uh, so the two of them are working hand in hand. But again, the cinematographer, who is not also a lighting designer, who does not see the need, to find an experienced lighting designer to agree on what they want to do together in quote, in pre-production is actually getting things wrong. So the question you ask now is a question, uh, is something that everybody should actually resolve in pre-production, resolve everything in pre-production. If uh, in pre-production, you have not decided on how you want everything to go, then you'll be on set and people will be having arguments, you understand? Like, for instance, lighting design, for instance, is a pre-production stuff. You don't do lighting design on the spot. When you are very experienced and off your head, just turning left and right, you can make lighting design decisions. No problem. If you've gotten to that point, it's beautiful. But then you have to know that that can only happen when you are the one calling the entire shot and you are not depending on any other person. 
you don't have to run things by someone else for approval, but they just you have the overall decision to make that. You understand? But if you are working with a huge team and then you want to impress your lighting, light, lighting design decision on everybody, then what you really need to do is make those decisions during pre-production. Make this up during pre-production. So, for instance, I have this movie. Let's okay now. Let's tell a collective story right here, right now. What is something that everybody can look at? Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. Now, let me throw a question open to you guys. If you wanted to see Jack and Jill went up the hill the way it was told, or the way we know it as that nursery rhyme or poem or whatever it is, does it strike you as a day thing or a night thing? Day. This. Huh? This. 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 Yeah, okay. Because, of course, children rhymes, nursery rhymes, everything has to be bright and beautiful. So, again, the first thing that will come to your mind is, okay, that's like a typical high-key lighting situation there, right? Yeah, but who says it must be? So, if you are called upon as a lighting designer, you'll be like, you know what? I don't want Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch the pill of water. I don't want that story to be a comedy. I don't want it to be drama. I want it to be a thriller. The moment I decide I want it to be a thriller, now let's make decisions together, everybody. Uh, I'll make the first decision. Someone goes up your hand, make the next decision. First decision here as a team is that we're going to shoot Jack and Jill went up the hill in the night. We shoot it in the night. Let's make it a thriller. Let's make it horrific. Let's make it a scary movie. So from this nice uh, nursery rhyme that children love, let's make it something that haunts children when they hear it now. That is our goal in this group right now. So number one decision, you see Jack and Jay went up the hill at night. Why would they go out at night to fetch a pail of water? Perhaps there was a lockdown and they didn't allow anybody to leave their houses and the only time they could run out to go and fetch us at night. So now we are building a story, right? So in the lockdown, Jack and Jill and their family, they had no water and then they had a plan to go out to fetch a pool of water at night so that they wouldn't die of dehydration and then they had to go out at night. Now let's plan the lighting design for this. So this happens at night. So that means what will your ambient lighting be if you're shooting a night scene? What's your ambient lighting? What is the generic uh, pantheon that the entire thing will have for night scenes? Uh, I, I, I will take a blue light. Yeah, beautiful. beautiful. Blue. So we have a we have a template of blue. So yes, yes. So blue, blue works for us. So our, our overall template is blue. I want us to take notes. So I'm telling you what we are doing now is what I do when I do my lighting design for things. So overall template. Can you hear blue. me, Stanley? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Sorry, I'm cutting yeah. you. Uh, I cannot hear you very well. Uh, is that the microphone problem or what? It's a little bass your sound. Uh, is, there, is there anyone else who can't hear me clearly? Everybody can hear me clearly, right? Yes. Uh, it's clear here. Yeah. I think it might be your mic settings. Uh. Uh, for the other, it's not the same problem. That's why I ask you. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what it is. Uh, I don't know what it is, but it's is definitely not from my end. Definitely not from my end. Uh, uh, I don't think it's from here. I don't think it's from here. Uh, maybe it's your microphone. I don't know. Uh, just try it again. Okay, so let, let's go on. Uh, I'll try and move closer, so I don't know if that helps you. Okay, so Jack and Jill went up the hill. We're shooting it at night now. So it's a night movie. Jack and Jill are going to go out to look for what at night. Uh, overall template is blue, right? Blue and uh, orange. Blue, orange. Why orange? Tell me. Because uh, it's mostly uh, the original uh, uh, light of the night for the house. For uh, for lots of house, we are using the, the orange. So, so we can use inside the orange and uh, mm -hmm. a source from outside blue yeah. for moon or for something. I don't know. Okay, beautiful. So you're you already, you've gone ahead of where we are. You're talking about how you're going to now light the scene. 
So we are still at what is the general template. If this was a painting on a canvas, what is the overall color, texture, what is the overall hue that you have? And again, I will agree that it is blue because it's at night. You understand? Uh, yeah. The using of orange for the house and all that, that works very well. But that's when we start talking about how do we want to design the interior scenes? And how do we want to design the exterior scenes and all that? But the first thing is that we have agree that overall texture, overall texture is blue because it's happening at night. You know that incandescent lighting and all that, exactly. So the temperature has to tilt towards blue, more of blue than, uh, than orange and red and all of that. Okay, so let's move on. So overall, overall uh, template, color template is blue. Uh, okay, now let's go into the design proper. Before Jack and Jill leave their homes at night, they are inside the house, we've established that uh, it's a lockdown situation. Nobody is expected to go outside. So that means they are kind of in hiding. They can't go anywhere. Uh, how would you heighten the tension in the scene when you uh, commence with your opening sequence? The first shot of Jack and Jill at home or wherever you put them, how would you heighten the tension? How would you like that scene? So we are starting from the first scene now. Let us design the lighting for the first scene. When your camera opens, Jack and Jill, how would you light the scene? Will you do high key or low key? Low key. Uh, do low key. Beautiful. Low key. Yeah. low key for me works. Okay, now we all know why we do low key because the low key will give us more drama. It will create more suspense. It will give us more tension in the scene as we are trying to create. Now, when you say low key, would you now go further to stress yourself some more to say, you know what, I want low key, but not with production light. I want low key with practical lighting. How many of us understand what practical lighting is? If you don't understand what practical lighting, just wave your hand and I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Okay, so practical lighting is uh, lighting the scene with natural lights that occur in the scene. So for instance, I'm in this room now, there's a light coming from this TV. I don't have any production light here now. So all the lights that I'm making use of are lights that exist in this room, right? But in a Jack and Jill story, even though this is our scene and this is all practical lighting going on here, I wouldn't light it this way. That means I will need to get rid of some of my practical lights that are in my scene to get the mood that I want. So the goal is always to work from dark to light. That is all, what I do all the time. In fact, I always find it funny when people talk about cinematography and they talk about only the camera and the camera and the camera and the camera. Uh, the last, uh, the first time Sony ever came to Nigeria was like two months ago, I was there. Uh, I demonstrated with the Sony FX9, the latest camera that they have, with Timothy Fermati, the guy who won the cinematography class. And one thing I was telling the guys, the, the global president of Sony was there, and I said, I said, you guys always have these uh, sessions where you showcase your cameras void of light. There's nothing you can do with your camera without light. You can shoot, yeah, you can have good lighting, but you cannot have good lighting design. Uh, you can do some things, but a very careful balance of lighting is where you are adjusting your light and at the same time adjusting the settings in your camera. If you are not doing the two at the same time, there's something wrong somewhere. Because I, I increase my shutter speed in my camera. I increase my shutter speed on my camera and then my light still looks too bright. Then I go, I move the light back away from my subject a bit. It's still not working. I throw a diffuser on it, it's still too bright. What's the next thing I'm going to do? I'm going to dial up my shutter speed again, as long as it's still within the range and the threshold that I should have for the exposure that I need, right? So what am I doing? I'm going back and forth between my camera and my lighting setup on set to achieve what I want to achieve. You get what I'm trying to say? So now, in this situation now, this light in this room is too much. Jack and Jill in the first shot will not look mysterious. People will not be scared of the way the movie starts. So what am I going to do? David, turn off the light. So I'm going to do this. So it looks even more mysterious. Okay, let's ignore the screen behind me. Uh, that screen is giving me too much light. Okay, let me not ignore it. David, where's the remote control? Turn off the screen behind me. 
Just a just a minute. Yeah, so, uh, oh, okay. Now, the only light coming in here is the light from the window, and that's my key light, right? So, all I have here is my ambient lighting. So, this is more practical than any practical you can turn up. Any other practical lighting here will be light bulbs, candles, lamps, all those things. Anything that is, that's an emitter of light that incidentally occurs in the scene without you naturally putting there. Even if you put it there in your set design, but it is believable because it's part of the props or the set of the, uh, it's not props, uh, the uh, set, set properties. It is part of the set property in your scene. It is acceptable as practical lighting as long as it's not hanging on a tripod or a light stand or something. It's on the wall, it's hand on the table, a tabletop light, a table lamp and all that, a candle, anything that emits natural light works for practical lighting. Okay, now we have this Jack and Jill went up the hill, first scene in the room. Do we think this lighting works? See the way I look now, everybody look at me. Does this work or do we need to turn it down a bit? We need to turn it down a bit. Okay, we need to turn it down a bit. So what do I do? That means I will need to either reduce the intensity of the light coming from my screen, which I can't do now because of this session, or what do I do again? If this was the light source, like I keep saying, you don't need to keep throwing a diffuser on the light. You can actually either move the light backward or move your subject backward. But most times the subject is fixed, so move the light backward. So let me okay. let me simulate what will happen if I was going to move the light backward. Check me out. You see what just happened? Yes. All of a sudden, this is looking more mysterious than the Jack and Jill. Now, I'm still demonstrating just with my normal Palace phone light. It's not a production light. But if you've been on set with me, every time I'm always asking people on set to give me their phones because I might have gotten my light in the way I want, but I just need to brush something. I just need to brush the side of the person's face. If you look at stills from my movies and all that, you always see that there's a light somewhere, especially in dark scenes, that is just going to outline the features of somebody. They come, hold this behind me. Sorry, I'm using my son as my apprentice today. So hold it behind me, hit the back of my head. I don't want to see the source of the light. Hide it, use my head to hide the light. Now, make sure it's hitting the side of my face. No, 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 make sure it's hitting my ear. No, 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 this way. Okay, can we see something happening there? Right? Now, this is no serious thing now, but check it out. Let's do this all of a sudden. And if this goes up here, either here or here, or this way, See what I'm practically doing is that I'm pulling the person away from the background. But in Jack and Jill's story, do we want to pull them away from the background or do we want to submerge them into the background? Which one works better? Do we want to, do we want to use the backlight to separate them from the background or do we want to leave them submerged into the background in this first shot? Remember, the goal is to keep it in the and make people scared. I, I, I will leave them to blend into the background for me. Anybody else? Yeah, I think it's more practical for them to blend into the background. Okay, it's more practical, yes, it's practical, but you know what we're talking about here is the design. So it has to be according to our design. So we are intentionally designing now. So we have the power to design. So what we will do, we will leave them to merge into the background or we will make them stand out by putting the backlight. Backlight will do. Backlight will do. Yeah. Okay, so backlight, what you've done with the backlight is that yeah. when you put the backlight there, you've made them stand out. Now everybody can tell that there's nothing coming from behind that can harm them. You know what you just did? You just reduce the mysteriousness of the scene. Yes. Yeah, so that's what just happened. Okay. When they are submerged into the background, the, the thought is something could be coming from behind. Why are these kids shivering and looking around as if they are expecting something to harm them? And they can't see anything around them. So the only light you can see most likely is just make the light from the window hitting their face and they're like... Yes. The moment you have this and you can tell what's happening behind them, trust me, uh, it reduces how much fear people express in the scene. Okay, so let's move on. We've agreed. First shot, submerge them into the background, very low key lighting, practical and everything. 
Now, Jack and Jill step outside the house. How should the exterior shirt be lit? What would you guys consider a very proper design for the lighting of the first time we see them outside? Now, don't forget that your lighting design doesn't come. David, give me high key lighting. I need to. I need them to see my face now. Yeah, no, turn it on. Okay, thank you. Back to high key. Okay. <laughs> so don't forget that the 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 lighting design is not void of your set or the location where you are filming. So that means you can decide to say the come out of the place, and then this is you don't have control over the ambience, the exterior. You can't light the sky, you can't light the environment, you can light objects in the thing. So you can only light the objects in every spot, in every scene, but you can't light the scene like ambience. You can't light outside, you can't light the sun, you can only light the human beings in the spots. You get what I'm trying to say? So of course, we still maintain our blue ambience, that's our tone, and this whole stuff. We've set the tone from inside. Now the goal is to maintain that tone outside. So another key decision when you're doing your lighting design for this story is try and keep the temperature of the light. So between the exterior shot and the interior shot, which one would you use to balance the other? Because you're going to, shoot, uh, you're going to go from one to the other. In your own thinking, which one should determine how the other looks? I have to balance uh, uh, interior for exterior. Okay, who has any other suggestion? Interior and exterior shots. The people are going to go from inside to the exterior. Between the interior and the exterior, which should decide how the other one looks? Should the interior decide how the exterior looks or the exterior decide how the interior looks? Um, I, I think the exterior, since it's a night scene. Uh, that's that's the perfect exterior. answer. The exterior has to decide, determine how the interior looks. So. Again, as a lighting designer, you can now make your notes in pre-production and tell the producer, you know what, I think when we're scheduling this scene, let's shoot the exterior first so that I have a template to work with for my exterior shots when I'm lighting my interior shots. I'm talking this way because I, just like when you talk about practical lighting, uh, I do most of my grading when I, sh when I shoot light. I'm, I'm grading my shots in the camera as I'm shooting. I don't depend on post-production. So if you've seen any movie, I'll share some screenshots with you guys so you see. Any movie I've shot, none of the movies I've shot uh, took my post-production time doing color with mm, I plan my lighting, I execute my lighting on set, and everything comes out exactly the way I imagine in my head. It's tedious. My crew members, uh, I won't say suffer. They pay the price because there is a lot of stress. Because if everything is not perfect the way I want, we won't move today. Uh, but the deal is that when we shot it that way, then there's nothing to touch in post-production. So that means I'm not shooting flat and deciding that, oh, in post-production, we're going to balance this with this. I'm shooting live, and what I want to achieve, I'm achieving live. So that means in that case, I'll need to tell if I wasn't the producer or director, if I was just called on as a lighting designer, maybe it's from a photographer, I'll tell them, when you're scheduling this thing, schedule the night scene with the exterior before the interior. Because I want to shoot the exterior, get my templates for the exterior, so that I can use that my reference when I'm lighting the interior. You understand what I'm saying, right? So again, I'm going through this process so that let's understand that lighting design is a pre-production, is a pre-production ritual. It's not a an on-set ritual, and it's definitely not a post-production ritual. Post-production is color grading and color correction. and that's what they do. Lighting design only happens when you're filming, but the design of the lighting. The best time for it to happen is in pre-production before you go on set. Because your lighting design will inform sets, it will inform locations, it will inform even props sometimes, it will inform costumes. Now let me tell you how it informs costumes sometimes. I just finished, okay, I didn't finish. I was on set filming a movie before this lockdown. And uh, Ronya was uh, part of us, she was my associate producer on the production. Um, when I sent her my pre-production breakdown, I called it my pre-production production book of life. Uh, the breakdown for costumes was almost 30 pages, right? Yeah, because I had to decide. I, did, I didn't leave that to the costumer. I wanted everything they were wearing to be part of my storytelling. So if someone is putting on a blue outfit in scene 27, 
it is because that outfit is part of my storytelling. So the outfit plus the colors in the scene, everything works together to tell the story I'm trying to tell. You understand what I'm trying to say? So as a lighting designer, if this wasn't my production, I would still do the same thing and I will share that document with the cinematographer, share it with the uh, set designer, share it with the producer and director, and I will leave all of them to make their decisions based on my recommendations. And if they respect me enough as a lighting designer, they will take my recommendations and they will work it into the overall plan for the movie. You understand what I'm trying to say? So again, it's for you to understand the importance of the role of a lighting designer on a film set. He determines a lot. I'll tell you three ways that you can tell a story. Uh, the first one is what everybody knows, which is dialogue, uh, which is why a lot of times we have so much dialogue in our movies in Nigeria, especially people talk, 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 they finish talking, they start talking again, they talk, 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 and check it out. Sometimes someone is about to kill somebody. And this is me looking at, I'm looking at Ronya now. And I'm looking at Ronya, just check me out. I'm not an actor, but I'm a really important with if you guys want to employ this guy. So check me out. I'm looking at Ronya. Now, check out the interpretation of this in many movies. What I will do to you, eh? When I finish with you, <laughs> when I finish with you, you die. You die. You will die. You, will die. you, will die. you will die. You see, the same thing I just did. And check out. I just did this now. Check out the non verbal expression of the same thing. See? Very simple. This is what your lighting design should also do in a movie. Your lighting design can actually reduce how much effort people put in some other areas that might even just be irrelevant. So, someone needs to say, you are going into that room and that room is dangerous. And I'd rather they didn't say it. But I'd rather someone was walking into the room. Someone else taps him, they exchange a glance, and the person just does this. And then I cut to the shot of the entrance to the room, and there's a red light coming from that room. You know already I've just said that that room is dangerous. Now, that is so beautiful when you say it theoretically like that, but now let's now dig it and work it out a bit more. Why will that room be to be red? Why would that one be red? There has to be a reason. There has to be a light emitting source in that room that's making the room red. So at 2 a.m. in the morning, when there isn't a solar eclipse or wherever it is, why will you have a bright red light coming out of the room? And what excuse can you use to put a bright red light there? That is where you now start appreciating the power of practical lighting. So now let me give you a simple example. In fact, let me pick your brains first of all. It's 2 a.m. This guy is about to walk into the room. His mom just nods and says no with her nod. And then we cut. The guy turns around. Camera follows him. And then he cuts the shot of the door. And there's a red light coming from that room. How would you make that work practically without making yourself look like I just put a red light there? What would you use to indicate the source of that red light? There could be um, it could be an alarm um, um, sound like emitting red lights that is coming okay. out from the room. Okay, but in our story, there's no alarm. Uh, I've made it harder now. Okay, there could be it could be a, uh, if it's fantasy, it could be a creature emitting the red light. <laughs> <laughs> that cricket was a giant cricket. <laughs> okay, it's not alarm. It's not fantasy. Tell me something practical. Um, let me think. Um, what about a TV screen? That's yeah, that could work. TV okay, screen. Now, or why? 
what excuse do you have for a TV screen showing red? A horror movie. It shows, movie. It shows there's trouble. Yeah, but what you know the trouble is that everything has to be explainable. You understand? A TV screen is bringing out red light. Why? What is showing on the screen that is red? Because you know you won't be depending on that red light from the TV screen to light the scene. We all know that you put a light and put a red gel on it. But then you just need people to believe that is the light from that TV screen. So what do you now do to the TV screen to make it believable that the light you are seeing emitting into that room is coming from the TV screen? It could be it could be like a um, like a club scene from the TV. And you know you what? It could be like a club scene, like like a club scene in the TV. Yeah, that's intelligent. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you know how club lights usually are. Yeah. So at that point in time, they're like a club scene, and you know, boom, yeah. You know okay, what I mean? so that means what you now have to do. You see, we are all making progress here. Now, what you now have to do in pre-production. If you have made your recommendation as a lighting design to have that red light coming from that room and having the TV as a source of the light, is to now say, can we either acquire or shoot a club scene and perhaps even grade it to look ready even a bit more so that when we are filming that scene, we have it showing on the TV for the entire sequence. So that you see what I'm trying to say. So again, it tells you that the decision you make as a lighting designer precedes the shoot because if you just got on set and we made this decision to put uh, a club scene on tv and we didn't have the footage to put on tv then you won't have an excuse to put that red light there you get what i'm trying to say that means that decision has to be made during pre-production we have to go and shoot that club scene if it's not red enough we'll do some more color grading to make it look very red and then when we are filming, we show the scene and we show the TV with that uh, club scene there. And then we know what we do naturally as lighting designers. We have our light to be jail there. But then we have told people that the light you are seeing you know, is not from any production light, it's from that TV, although we know it's not. So again, yeah, that's how you would do that. So now let's jump back to Jack and Jill. So Jack and Jill, we are stealing from the exterior as our inspiration for the interior. So now when we do that, we now match the shots so that the whole movie looks the same way from scene to scene. That's why that's what you do when you do color uh, grading and color correction sometimes, but it's more about a grading thing because all the scenes must look like they were shot on the same camera at the same time with the same settings because of course we know that doesn't happen. Okay, now they get outside. What is the first thing that we hit Jack and Jill when they open the door and step outside, if you're the lighting designer, what would you do? My son is trying to answer here. Okay, well, what if we assume it's full moon? And the Thank you. Is, full moon. Right? Full moon is the answer. How will the full moon hit Jack and Joe? Tell me. Okay, the full moon hitting Jack and Jill, let's take the three-point lighting now. There's key light, there's few light, and there's backlight. The full moon hitting Jack and Jill, will you make it a key light, will you make it a few light, will you make it a backlight? Don't forget, our, okay. theme, is, our theme is mysterious. So we make it key, key or backlight. Okay. I'll make, I'll make it I think a backlight. So. Okay. Backlight is the perfect backlight. alternative. You know why yes, backlight? Yes. Because the backlight hits them from behind, and then you are seeing your silhouette, and then you can stage a key light somewhere so that, let me tell you what I usually do in situations like this. I stage, I'm a lover of backlights. If you, if you know me, I love, I can't do without my backlights. My backlight, if you give me only backlight, I'll light a whole thing. Uh, so the backlight hits them, the backlight makes the moment everywhere is dark and the light is just coming from behind, the person already looks mysterious. Uh, Take your mind back to Don Corleone and The Godfather. The lighting design for Don Corleone as a character was such that throughout the movie you were not permitted to see his eyeballs clearly. You know what that did? It made him look like a mini god, as if he was not just human. So go back and look at The Godfather. Even the posters, you see that 
The lighting was David, turn off this light. Turn off this light. Turn this off. The lighting was always coming from somewhere here. And then there wasn't let me block up some of my uh let me block up some of my key lights coming from the window. Uh, okay, I can't do it successfully, but anyhow, the lighting was almost always like this. In a way that and they didn't allow the key lights or the field lights to interfere with that overhead light that they put on the soft box. So what was happening with that overhead light in all the things, not just one, was that those overhead lights were now making him cast a shadow of his brow against where his eyes should be. And then scene from scene to scene, you couldn't see the eyes of the Godfather. Why do you think musicians put on glasses? The bands, two face, all those guys. That's a little bit to go everywhere, but guys, many of them are not so, they don't know how to handle crowd. They don't, some of them have low self-esteem. Some of them have, uh, they are not just comfortable with themselves. But you know the funny thing, once you wear those dark shades, you feel like nobody can see through me. Turn on the light, David. The same thing that happens with lighting design. Every time you can see everything in somebody's eyes, you've seen everything about the person. Like, look at me now. There is nothing that can hide from you. If I was happy, you could tell from my eyes. If I was sad, you could tell from my eyes, so you can see everything. But the moment this light goes up, I'm, I'm kind of casting a shadow. You can't see my eyeballs, so there's nothing. You can't tell everything about me. So that's what happens with the backlight. So the backlight keeps it mysterious. Now, we want the backlight. Okay. Uh, in fact, happening? we are making the personality with lighting. Uh, exactly, exactly. So this is what I want to do to, with Jack and Jay now. So here's what I will do, and then I'll trade to you guys to continue. What I will do, I'll make Jack and Jill come out of the house. The house is dark. Uh, like we said, we want to always make them emerge from the darkness. So that means I won't put any light behind them. So it will look like they're just emerging from the darkness. So the door opens. In a normal scene, there will be some backlight to make them stand out. But continuing with the lighting design in the first interior scene where they were just submerged in the background, I will continue with the same mechanism when they come out of the door. So my medium shot of them coming out through the door from an angle would be of them opening the door and the door clicks slowly and then you see them emerge. And then on the background is the full moon. So here's what you can do. In case there's no full moon or no moon at all when you are shooting, you can actually place your production light where in the direction that the full moon should be coming from. You can split your screen in two and make sure it is locked on the tripod, right? So that means on the part where your production light is, if it, if it needs to be that close to the person to give it the intensity you want, you can even have it to be stand there in the shot, knowing that in post-production, you have two slates of that same shot. And the second one, you can actually crop from one side to the other, and it should just be like one continuous scene. And what you cannot do in post-production is to impose a full moon there. For those of us who do VFX and all of that, I put a full moon there and it looks like, oh, there was a full moon on the day Jack and Jay went up the hill. You understand? So what has happened now is that that light is hitting them and they come out of the place. And the first thing we see is their silhouette, right? Their silhouette. And then how do we introduce, how do we introduce, uh, how do we introduce another source of practical light to them? that will not aid them through the journey to get to the top of the hill. And please, not touch light. Give me another suggestion. So they walk out of the house just the way they are. First of all, we see them in shadow. That is the way we want it in their silhouette. But according to our lighting design, after the first silhouette, we want to now see a bit of them. A bit of them. We're keeping it practical. So practical lighting. So I need suggestions. Use lights coming out from other houses before they get to the hill. Okay, that's a beautiful suggestion. That means Jack and Jill, unlike the Jack and Jill in the nursery land that we know, they are not living in this countryside alone with their family. That means the other houses around them. It's a modern Jack and Jill and they have other homes there. You understand? So that works for me. But again, you know, they will walk past those houses and walk away. How does the lighting remain with them consistently? So. Now, let us maybe make this suggestion to the production uh, team and the producer and tell them, you guys need to buy this because this is what I want to use to light Jack and Jill when they are going up the hill. So what do we put there? 
not touch like that would be the fastest thing. I don't want to touch. Okay, let's keep it fun. Let's let's make it a fantasy. So Jack and Jill step Are out. Are they using a mobile phone? No, no mobile phone, no touch light. Hey, 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 the two that they had. Okay, can I say something? <laughs> okay. What if there's a vehicle behind them that uh, puts on lights? Vehicle behind them. Okay, yes. now let's let's borrow from let's borrow from what the first person said and what you said. Let's borrow from the lights. Let's borrow from the lights from other houses. So the first light that we hit them, uh, those lights are lights from other houses, and then they continue, and then there's someone whose car is parked somewhere, maybe he has a flat tire. You see, you see how we are now modifying a story that already exists because of what we want to do with our lighting design. You, you get what I'm trying to say? So in the, uh, in the initial production design and pre-production meetings, nobody was talking about a car with a flat tire. But all of a sudden now, because of the decision of the lighting designer, Part of the props in that movie will not include a car with a flat tire because that car, the headlamp has to be on because the person is trying to fix his tire and then the beam is getting to Jack and Jill's path as they go up the hill. You see how our decisions are now beginning to shape what the entire production will look like. So now they've gone past the path, the places where the houses can help and where the beam of the lights up from the car can help, how they now continue. Okay, what if they have, when they pass that, they have to get through a grassland, a bushy part, a bushy, very wide mass land of bushy, where they climb the hill. So where would the light come from in that bushy part now? Um, it is light you are looking okay. for, girl. <laughs> the light for the moon. <laughs> See, yeah, moonlight. The, let me tell you why the moonlight won't work. We establish the moonlight as being behind them. The moonlight cast the dark light the, the, the light from the moon in the first shot when they step out of the house, we establish as backlight casting behind them so they cannot be facing the moon again. You see? So they can't face the moon. The moon is behind them. What uh, if you have a bunch of fire, fireflies? Thank you. I was waiting for someone to say that. So we keep it like a fantasy. And then all of a sudden, as they are going, one firefly just flies past. Oh, the next one, another one, the third one. And then a swamp of them. Woo! And they begin to run after the firefly till they get to the top of the hill. All of a sudden, our lighting design decisions have included VFX in this movie that the producers did not think about from the beginning. You see how it works. So now, fireflies get them to the top of the hill. And they are at the top of the hill now, getting their water. The fireflies will not stay there and give them just light. They will continue on their journey as it. So now, how do they get light? By the well. <laughs> this is the limit of this is the limit of practical lighting now. Now, how do they get lit by the well? There was another person there with a torch light. <laughs> <laughs> what? But, what? Sorry, if if I if I was coming, I I would not even take the risk because first they will go mountain, so definitely they will have any the smallest uh, the smallest uh, 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 point of light on their own because they won't go into the darkness without a light. So definitely, so, 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 According to our story, there was a global lockdown, and nobody's supposed to leave their homes. So that means they can't go out with light. So let's go back to the origin of the story. Thank you. Uh, you are looking for an escape oh. today. God, don't catch you. But then, <laughs> since they're on the top of the hill, though, we can have um, we can have the moon. I can have reflection via the water. Okay, reflection from the water. Okay, now let me yes, tell sir. you what can happen. That's an interesting and intelligent decision. Can someone tell me why that reflection from the water is important? Now, that means we have to insinuate that the well is almost full because the water has to be at a high level for us to see reflections, right? So again, we have increased the work of the pre-production and uh, production crew and everybody. Now we need a well that is full, not just any well at all. So you see how all our decisions are increasing the workflow. So now we need lights to hit the water, that means the water level has to be very high. Now, 
when you want to use that water as a source of light bouncing on their faces, how would you now position Jack and Jill so that the light from the moon, which was behind them, can now work practically for them? That means you're blocking. That means all of a sudden now, the lighting designer who wasn't called the director or the DOP is beginning to give blocking. That means Jack and Jill cannot back the moon. They were backing the moon all the while. So even, oh, yeah. without, even without the reflection of water, the angle they stand when they turn around, when they want to press the water, that means they can go around the stuff. That means in our story, we'll now say the fireflies went around the uh, well and they followed the fireflies. The, the fireflies dissipated. And at that point, Jack and Jill, they were standing at the spot where they were facing the moon. And all of a sudden, we don't even need that water anymore. You see how it works. And all of a sudden, because we know the moon was always behind them, they can now put our production light and put a lot of diffusers or just move it away from there as much as possible to stimulate the light coming from the moon. And all of a sudden, at the top of the hill, Jack and Jill have light. We understand that, right? Okay, now, they get the water, they are going back down. Uh, when they are going back down, that guy has fixed his car, so the car is not there anymore. Uh, and the lights from the houses that lit them before, I don't take lights. There's no light anymore. <laughs> so you guys, tell me how you light that country. So now I'm the one learning from you. Tell I don't even have light. fireflies anymore. No fireflies, they all died. <laughs> Wait, the moon is now, since they are coming back, the moon is now fixed. The moon is now on their face. Thank you. Exactly. You see, you see what's going on now? So we are thinking through the lighting situation and how to design everything. This is what lighting design is. It's not just throwing lights in places. It's having very intelligent reasons for doing everything you do with the light, uh, whether to just eliminate the character or to use the hue or intensity of the color of the light as part of your storytelling and all that, which we've done some of them already, already right now. So now they are facing the moon again and they have good light going down. You see how this would have uh, looked like a very difficult case to crack if someone just threw at you. But see, now thinking about it and going step by step, see how we are solving the problem. And then someone who is an experienced uh, professional in lighting design or cinematography will look at the movie and appreciate the amount Please, can we need to mind, please, and appreciate the amount of work you put into your lighting design when they see what you've done. Now, the light from the moon hits them till they're about to enter inside the house. At this point, we want to see more of what's happening inside the house. You know, we never established that their parents were ill or anything, right? So now this is where we get to find out that their mother was actually sick and their father was crippled. If not, why would the kids go up the hill by themselves instead of sending their parents, instead of their parents going to get the water at night during a lockdown? So now, beyond just the source of light that we've done so far, can you guys tell me how you will now use your lighting design in terms of color and value to now tell the emotional aspect of the story of what's happening to Jack's father and mother, and Jack and Jill's father and mother? from the point where they're about to enter the house, where the light from the moon cannot help them anymore. Sorry, do you mind if I say you would do a quick recap? Sorry, sorry about that. Okay. Jack and Jill went up the hill, that's the story we're talking about. Jack and Jill had to go up the hill to fetch a pail of water. But till now, nobody knows why. Nobody knows it's because their parents are not everybody. Nobody knows because their mother is down with coronavirus and their father is crippled. So now we use the lighting to keep them mysterious. And because we said we don't want a happy story, we want a gloomy, moody, uh, thriller-based storytelling, right? Which is what we've achieved so far with the low-key lighting that we've sustained. Now, we are going beyond just the low-key lighting and the, uh, uh, the whole shrouded, uh, mystified image that we have. And now we're going to use the lights and the colors to tell the story of what's happening to Jack and Jill and the situation with their parents. That's where we are now. So we are going to use our lighting design now to tell more of emotions than just as sources of uh, practical lighting to light them, to keep them mysterious, 
so that we can sustain what we've tried to do so far is keep them mysterious to sustain our original intent, which is to make it gloomy, use a lot of low key lighting, and keep them mysterious. But now we are at the point where we need to use the lighting design to tell the story, the emotional story that uh, Jack and Jill are experiencing. Okay. Okay. So what, what if they enter the room and there's a lantern on the table with um, the father on a wheelchair beside their mother lying on the chair seat? There's a lantern, a lantern light, kerosene lantern light. Okay, lantern light will give you a warm, warm, uh, warm, warm, warm light, right? Warm so yes, why, what would that be doing? Lantern, father and mother and all that. I, it is not right, it is not wrong. It is only wrong if you can't give me a reason behind it. So now, what's the reason for the warm light like, between the, their father and mother? Tell me, what's your reason? You know yeah. the light, you um, know the lantern. You, you know, you, you can say, I'm not doing any lighting design, it's just a lantern there. You know, it's okay. simple. So it's just a lantern. Yeah. But now we are saying you've been called on this project to be the lighting designer, and you want everybody to understand that every decision you take in terms of light light sources, emissions and reflections and bounces of light, that it is actually well thought to have a philosophical and psychological meaning and drive the emotions of the scenes as well. So I need to understand why you put that lantern as emitting that one light in the scene. Okay, let's assume um, they are not wealthy, like they don't have really much money, like maybe they are around wealthy people. So that's why they actually have to go fetch water during the night. Then the no, other they're not, they're not, they're not judging the question. It's not about their wealth okay. or their state. It's now that light. Like I said, we've gone from just light being, uh, so from sources of light and so, lighting okay. the scene, lighting the scene to sustain this low key mystery and keeping everything crazy and foggy. Now we've transcended, we've uh, transcended from that. So now using the light and the colors of the light and the values of the light as a okay. tool for telling the emotional aspect of the story. So now we are back to the not it doesn't matter whether they are worthy, it's emotions now. Okay. We're talking about emotion. Okay. So uh, okay. Uh, what we assume the lantern is like um, the lantern light tells I shows tense a tense feeling in the scene. Maybe um, the mom is sick, they really need to get water for her to take drugs or something. Something like that. Okay, so it's showing, it's still showing that in yes. the midst, in the midst of the affliction that this couple of, uh, is going through, they see this sincere and genuine love and yes. affection that they yes. share. Yeah. You see, without yes, that yes. reason, without that reason, you've not done lighting design. You've just thrown a light there. Okay. So now let's pick your reason. Okay. And that your reason is now going to enter our book of lighting design for this particular movie, and it will be credited to you to say, oh, this is the reason why we did this here. Because the lighting designer said so. You see where I'm going to. It has to be the lighting designer said so, and he didn't just say so for me, he said so because of X, Y, Z. Right? Okay. So we yes. agree that there's we agree that there's a lamp there, and the lamp has to be kept between the father and the mother. So it's emitting practically the same amount of light on the two of them and bouncing of them so that they have equal affection towards each other. And that is the reason. For that setup in our lighting design plan you understand so now let's yeah. move on so jack and jill walk into the room what's the first thing they should do how when they walk to go when they walk into the room before they go and meet their parents they're still holding the buckets of water what is the first thing we will change from the way we've been lighting them don't forget the way we've been lighting them they've always been submerged in the dark now they are walking to their parents they walk into the door. What's the first thing that will change in the way they are lit? The colors. The colors? Is it the colors or the position of the lights or whether they are getting the key lights, key lights or backlight based on their interaction with the scene? Ah, okay. Because now they are walking in through the door like and there's the a moonlight outside. So the moonlight gives them backlight from outside. And so for the first time, we are seeing them in an interior scene. Can, can that person use his mic, please? 
Okay, so for the first time, we're seeing them in an interior scene. Uh, so I'm going to mute everybody for now. So for the first time, we are seeing them in an interior scene where they have backlight and they're not submerged into the darkness anymore. You understand what's going on? So now, for the first time in the lighting design for Jack and Jill interior, we have backlight included to their lighting. All we had before was kill light. So we had the key light with a very low intensity just to maintain that low, uh, low key lighting and keep everything mysterious and moody. But now for the first time they are walking back into the room with the help of the lights coming from outside uh, on the moon they now have backlights hitting them so for the first time they have both backlight and key light so the key light will be whatever source of light is strongest in the room when they enter and for the sake of uh, being able to tell uh, a, a more interesting story uh, i'm going to unmute everybody but please uh, let's mute ourselves we are not talking so for the sake of being able to, uh, come on now, somebody's mic is still on. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, so for the sake of being able to still tell a convincing story, do we make, do we make the light from the lamp to the parents, their key light, would that be the best lighting design option that we have? Do we make the light with the parents, the key light, as they are walking into the room, or do we choose another source of light as their key light? I'm not talking, I'm new to my face. Okay, since nobody is talking, let me just answer the question. What I would do if I was the one doing this, I won't make the light, I won't make the light from the their key light. I will make I will, I will, I will put another incidental light there. When I say incidental, it's practical. That means there's a light source, maybe a bulb. So even if there wasn't a bulb by the doorway in that house originally, uh, when we go to do our location we will have to plant a lamp holder there and put a bulb there. So as they are walking into the room, there's a source of light that's giving them key light to their faces, right? And then I'm going to now determine, you know what, since the key light will be here, so the key light, they are walking into the door, the key light should be, the key light should be here. So they walk in, there's a backlight from the moon, and the key light is shading their face on this side. Sorry, can we mute your mic if you are not talking? So the key light is hitting their faces from this side, and the parents are positioned there, on the other side. So they get into the room, they drop the bucket of water. Now, as they are walking towards their parents, on this side of the room, that key light now replaces the backlight from the moon and becomes their backlight. You see what I'm doing? I'm, I'm moving things. I'm, I'm changing the designations of light based on how the block is in the scene. So the key light on that place becomes their backlight because they're going to shut the door and the light from the moon can no longer be their backlight. You understand what I'm trying to say? So that key light that was here becomes their backlight as they approach their parents and then the light from the touch uh, lamp the parents are holding becomes their key light. You see how it's working. So now we have backlight and we have their parents' light being the key light. Now we need a field light to complement what the key light is doing. Where will the source of the field light be? So you know the key light is the brightest light to be the character. Backlight is coming from outside. The field light lights up the part of the face that the, the key light is not really lighting. So if the key light was coming from here, you have to put your fuel light here to at least put some uh, nuances and put some details on that part of the face. So now they are from their parents. The light that was their key light before is now behind them. And now they are putting the parents. So the first light that was their key light before is now their backlight. The light from the lamp is now their key light. Where will the source of the fuel light be if you are lighting practically? Um, please, sir, can you do a recap? I didn't really get it. Okay, now they've entered the house. They've entered the house and they've shut the door. The key light that they had when they just walked into the room was on the left. Now they shut the door. The back light was from the moon with the door shut. So guys, can we mute our mics? Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to mute everybody. 
Okay. Okay. So the initial key light, the initial key light has now become their backlight. Now the lamp that their parents are holding have become their key light. I'm just saying what we now, if we are keeping everything uh, low key lighting and practical lighting, what would be the steel light to complement the key light? Because you know that steel light, depending on how you spread it out, the steel light could also now give a bit of backlight on the angle on the side of uh, the people's body that it's coming from. So what do you think would be, okay, yes, uh, Andrea, Andrea, yeah, you. The moon from the window, or if it comes thank from you. another reflection. Thank you, thank you, thank you, you see? So all of a sudden, the moon that was backlight before swapped the, its relevance and became uh, fuel light. The key light, when they walk into the door, swapped its relevance and became backlight. And then the lights from the parents became their fuel light. So what we are doing now is that we, we are making the characters walk into lights that have been pre-planned for them. You see, so what we do now, we pre-plan how the key point lighting will remain throughout the movie. And then when we go and say, oh, no. Okay, so what we've done now is that we've pre-planned how the three point lighting will remain consistent throughout the movie. At every point in time, when, when you do practical lighting, you are thinking in this scene or this sequence, how do I still maintain my three point lighting system? It's not every time you keep moving lights about, sometimes you just block the people to you know from their uh, orientation and their position. One light that was this, that was key light before, when they move from one point to the other, can become fuel light. The light that was fuel light before, when they turn around. So now let me ask the question. When they move away from where their parents are and they are walking back through the door because the security men who saw them going up the hill came to the house to arrest them. When they turn around to go and open the door for those security men, you know automatically the lamp now becomes a backlight for them. Now the key light that was there when they walked in through the door returns to its relevance as key light and then the light from the moon which must be adjacent to where they are and which must conform to our location that we're getting during our recce we now be giving them fuel light you see how it's working now so at every point in time we can't just say this is key light all the time uh, although that's how it's stopped most of the time we just be like okay key lights always key lights key lights always key light backwards always backlight but if you are actively blocking people and making them move from point a to point b you have to understand that light will change in their relevance. The light that was key light before can become fuel light. The light that was key light before become backlight. So now they are walking back to the door to answer the policemen or security guys who are there. And all of a sudden, the lamp is now backlight. The moonlight from the window is now their fuel light. And then the key light from the beginning when they walk into the room the first time, it remains, it comes back to being the key light. So I'm going to unmute everybody now and uh, okay, not I won't unmute everybody, just unmute yourself if you want to. So if you have any questions before we continue. Yeah, sorry, I have a question yeah. about key lights. In a case where the subjects are stable, where you're switching okay. between the shots. Okay, baby, don't distract me. Is that? So in a case where the shots, the, the characters are in one position. But you have medium shots and they are facing each other. So um, one, I don't know if you know what I mean. One shot is facing this way, hitting him, and then you use the second shot facing facing the same way. Is it advisable to switch like using a key light for one and switching it to a backlight? Um, would that work well? Yeah, what you need to do is just maintain maintain the orientation of the light and the direction from where they are coming all the time. So. Uh, let me tell you, very intentional and effective lighting design requires for you to move your light every time your shot changes. Every time you change from a wide shot to a medium shot, the amount of light that hits the character in a wide shot cannot be the same intensity when you go to a medium shot or a close-up shot. So if you think you just set up one light and you work for everything, that is why uh, for TV and soap, they just do high key lighting because it always looks consistent no matter what happens but for film you cannot that's why film cannot just be high key for you to keep it low key and uh, moody 
and how they actually match with Kila and all that. Every time your character, your camera changes, your lighting has to change. It's either you're moving the light closer. Uh, so let's say a wide shot. Let me ask a question now. So if you had one lighting set up for a wide shot, if you are going from that wide shot to a close-up shot, what would you do with the light to keep it consistent? Do you think it will be more diffused or not? You know, the farther away you move a light, the more it spreads, right? You understand? The farther away you move the light, the more it spreads, it diffuses more. The closer it gets, it's spotted, right? So, for a wide shot where the light was so far, uh, was so close up, right? It was close to the people. When you come to a medium or close up shot, if you leave it at the same position, it's going to be high key lighting in that situation because it's just spread all over the person's face. So if you move it back a bit and close your band door a bit, it will now maintain the same look that it had in the white shot. So again, every time you change your shot, your lighting changes. So that means when you are doing your storyboard or planning your shot list, you should plan to shoot uh, <laughs> as much as you can, shoot all the close-ups at the same time. All the, so it's, that's why I work with the storyboard. I just cancel out what I've shot and all that. I shoot all my close-ups for this dialogue at once. I shoot all my white shots and I shoot with one camera so there isn't any other camera doing anything. So all the close-ups, all the mediums, all the white, all I need to do is look at my storyboard and my shot list and cancel what I've done so I know what is left to do and then I move on. I hope that answers the question. Yes, that, that answers my question. Okay, any other question, guys? Uh, sorry, um, maybe I misunderstood this question, but uh, what I was thinking is because it was asking the question whereby you're taking a medium shot of two individuals having a conversation, and then you're having an angle where you're facing one individual, and you're having another angle, taking it as a, a camera angle from another angle where you're taking the other person because the person now is talking you get now mm -hmm. so now what i thought he was asking is take for instance in one of the angles you have um, your back lights and your fuel lights on the other angle are you expected that was what i thought he was asking that are you expected to interchange the light now, or you maintain your lights in positions because by the time you're changing from one angle of the camera to the other obviously the um i think the lighting is going to change Okay, I, I think for emphasis, what I'll say is this. In lighting design, your emphasis and your goal is not to maintain light position. It's to maintain a feel and a look. So all you need to do, anyhow you interpret it, is maintain, maintain the feel, maintain the look. Maintain the feel and maintain the look. As long as from shot to shot, all the shots look the same, then you are good. You understand? The light doesn't have to be... If you've ever been on set with me, uh, beyond maybe the production lights I put up and all that, I have people everywhere. That's why I always work with the same crew all the time. They always have these lights. You see these lights? I have gels and diffusers cut to this shape. So to maintain what I got with maybe like uh, my red head and all that on a close-up shot, the red head will be too bright for what I want. All I need to do, I have my combination of diffusers and gels that I've made to match every other big production light. They just trap it there and they bring it close to the person or far from the person exactly the way I want. So the orientation from where the light is coming remains the same. But many times it's not the same source of light. But the goal is for the shots to look the same and consistent from shot to shot. But whether the position of the light remains the same throughout, that is only practical for TV and soaps. But for film, it just has to change. Okay, you another question. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm guessing there's no other question. So I'm about to put, bring this to an end. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to bring this to an end now, but uh, I'll schedule another session where we'll come back together and I'm going to give you guys something to do so that I'm going to do it too, uh, so that we all just exchange. We're going to do lighting design for a project and each person will tell us what he's going to do and why he's going to do it. He tell us why, how, and the thing is we are keeping it low-key, we are keeping it moody and cinematic, 
And very importantly, we're using the lighting to tell the story, the emotional part of the story. So here's the story. Uh, I think, let me record this. Uh, I won't forget it uh, in, in case I need to, I need to recap. Okay, so here's the story. It, um, yeah. Okay, so here's the story. The story is, uh, uh, a guy takes his wife to the hospital and she's about to have a baby and he's there and then day becomes night and he's still sitting at the same spot and then he walks to the end of the room and then he encounters the doctor who gives him some bad news and he's walking back to where he was seated and then where he was seated before uh i want us to change i want to change the emotion and the mood not keep the same mood but just change the emotion from where he received the bad news from the doctor till he comes back to that seat before he received the bad news obviously he was expectant he was uh, anticipating the birth of his child so everything was good and beautiful to him now he's received the bad news i want to change uh, the emotions with the use of light and color by the time it comes back to where he was seated. So that means decide what light you want to use, decide what color, decide what intensity is going to be like. And then I want two people to walk into the scene and sit beside him. I want you to use the colors on the people's costumes and what they are wearing as your reason for bouncing some soft light on this guy to tell the next story of what you want. This is the subjective part. How does the story end? Two people are going to walk into that room, sit down on the bench beside this guy, and one on the left, one on the right, decide whatever they are wearing, and tell me how they are going to use, you know, there's something called ambient diffusion in animation, where an object that's very close to you begins to reflect, it bounces off you. And if you, uh, if you set the level of your, if in your camera settings, if you set the level of your lighting, you know, there's a, there's a certain you can choose there and the very, a very small reflection of one color begins to bounce off on the other one. I want to use that uh, technique to now say, oh, that means it can't be harsh, it has to be subtle. If someone is putting on a red shirt, for instance, that means you begin to see some, and the person is sitting close to this guy, you begin to see some reflection of red bouncing on the skin tone and all that. So decide what the color is, decide what the people are wearing, and decide how, what they are wearing, and the colors are going to bounce on this guy's face because of the inspiration from what people are wearing will be the end of your story and that end of the story is subjective to you but let it be tied to the colors bouncing of the outfit of the two people who come and sit down with this guy and let's all have very different stories but let it be intentional and let the outcome of the story be as a result of the lighting design we've done we all got it right if there's any question let me know if not we'll wrap up this for now so we set up another another session where we we'll just come back and share ideas on this. So actually, I don't really get the parts where um, the two individuals come in. I didn't get the story from that angle. Yeah, from the parts where the two individuals come in, the story becomes yours. It's not we know the story up to the point where the guy is giving it bad news. When he goes back to the seat, whatever you choose to do, but the thing is that. You have to change his mood, change the story curve with your lighting design. So that means maybe he was sitting down there, but okay, I'll just give this clue. So let's use this clue. Sitting down there before everything was bright, there was this warm light. Why was a warm light hitting him where he was standing? For instance, if I'm thinking about this on the spot now, because as lighting designers, we need to think on our feet. So why was the light, warm light hitting him where he was sitting? Maybe because the light to the operating room, the door to the operating room was open. And you know, they always have all these warm lights in the operating room and all that, where they do the surgical operations and all that. So that door was open before the doctor called, got, uh, got his attention from the end of the hall. And by the time he walked to the end of the hall and got the bad news and came back to where he was seated, that door was shut and another door was open, maybe to the chemist or where it could be ICU or wherever, or the X-ray room. And that's where that blue light is now hitting from. So with the excuse of that light coming from that room, we are making him look gloomy by introducing some blues to him. So this remains consistent, but when two people walk into the scene and sit beside him, it's now your decision to make the story end in a happy way or a sad way. 
and the pointer to how it's going to end has to be what those two guys are wearing. But it can't be black. It has to be colors that can be reflected on this guy's body or face to tell, okay, and we're going to use an excuse of those colors to now introduce some production light in a subtle way that will look like it's just ambient occlusion bouncing from the people's outfit to his face. And then we end our stories subjectively, in a very subjective way. And that's the end of the story is up to you. Just make sure However, you decide to design the light is derived from what the people are wearing when they walk to come and sit down beside this guy. And let that be the emotional part of the story you are telling. And the conclusion of the story has to also be tied to the colors in the final scene. Tell us why you are putting these colors there. Tell us the significance of the color. Tell us your philosophy for what you have done in your storytelling style with these things you've done too. And we'll meet together and just finalize on that. Excuse me, Stanley. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Good. All right. He said the guy took his wife to the hospital. I think day becomes night. Did I hear that? Or, or just yeah, day becomes night, yeah. Okay. Okay, no problem. Yeah. So, day becomes night is the first clue I've given to you guys. Interpret day becomes night. So that means they got there during the day, then he's there till night. How would the colors change? How would the ambient colors in the scene bounce off him? How would that be part of your story? Are you going to use colors that uh, represent fear and uncertainty? Uh, that's what I would do if I were you. I will use colors that represent fear and uncertainty at that person when they get to the hospital and he's there. And later in the night, everything is warm. That means he's becoming hopeful. Perhaps why does he become hopeful? Perhaps because someone just walked out of the labor room and the husband was happy because his wife gave birth. So he begins to feel, oh, my own case will not be different. My wife will come out alive and there won't be any problem. You see how all his thoughts and all the emotions are playing out in the colors that I'm using. So that's what I want us to do. Use the colors as a medium for telling the story. I can't hear you. Oh, yeah. Andrea, I can't hear you. You can, you can speak. Okay, sorry. Can you hear okay. me now? <laughs> yeah, I can. Okay. Um, when are we supposed to tell you our uh, end story endings? Is it now or are you going to give it? No, 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 no. Uh, let's, 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 uh, we're going to use the same link. I'm going to share the same thing. Let's come back here. And what's the time now? These are uh, two or six. Is, is, if we say three hours, is that, is that enough time for us to notice that? Three hours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay three hours. So just have it, have it written out and make it a one pager. One pager. Have it written out. So if uh, we are twenty one here, so if each session reaches one page in one minute, in twenty one minutes we're done, and in thirty minutes the session is over. Okay. Thanks, guys. So thanks for joining. Okay. You have sorry, 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 sir. I, I didn't get the whole stuff complete. I don't know if you can send the recording. I will. I will send you. the recording. I will share okay, the recording. Please. Thank you very much. Sir. Peace, guys. Festival we call for your dog. Every time for festival we call for your dog. Every time for festival we call for your dog. We celebrate your I was young and many years. Yeah, yeah. You can stand here and watch me sing. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful preparation. It's a real time entertainment. Yeah. I was young and many years. Yeah, yeah. Superstars from around the world. Actors, film makers from around the world. Come around just to get things done. Now. We are getting down from original special thing that we are done. Everything so pure, entertainment say we done. Yeah, 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 yeah. Every time for festival we come for your dog. Every time for festival we come for your dog. Every time for festival we come for your dog. We celebration here. Every time for festival we come for your dog. Every time for festival we come for your dog. Every time for festival we come for your dog. We celebration. Yeah. 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 Yeah.